Hello, my name is Marcus Brandt. I'm the head of mission of International IDEA Myanmar program. And today I'm talking to David Gum Ong, who is the Deputy Minister of International Cooperation of the National Unity Government of Myanmar. Uh, and uh, it's a great honor to have you today, David. And uh, it's been a great pleasure to work with you. And I would like to ask you a few things about uh, your experience in the NUG. The NUG is now more than three years old. Uh, few people had expected uh, when it started that it, well, how much it would achieve. You joined in November 22. You are the second youngest uh, member of the NUG as deputy minister, the youngest male. Uh, and I would like to ask you, so how has this been, how, how has this been for you in this very unusual experience? This is the first time for you also to serve in government. Mm. Uh, but what in all, overall has been your, your experience as a member of the NUG? Uh, thank you, Marcus. Uh, it's a great pleasure. Uh, and it's good to see you again. It's been a while. So um, my name is David uh, and uh, I joined the NUG in 2022, uh, November 2022. So it's uh, my, it's been up, almost have a year and a half. So this November, it'll be my second year anniversary with the NUG. Um, definitely, you know, the experience has been surreal uh, on one hand and challenging uh, for sure. Uh, part largely because, you know, I, uh, I didn't, I didn't uh, have any plans to, you know, work for government, you know, uh, previously, or uh, did I have any intentions whatsoever to, to, uh, you know, join a resistance movement. Uh, but obviously there was this military coup 2021 uh, and uh, I had no other options but to really uh, stand on the right side of history. And uh, you, know, you, you, uh, you were right about, uh, you know, the sort of the challenging environment uh, in general. And, uh, but uh, again, you know, uh, it's, it's been quite a fulfilling and enriching experience as well because of uh, the, uh, the people that I call my colleagues and comrades, uh, we're all in this together. And uh, despite uh, many challenges and, uh, you know, different working styles, uh, I think mostly, you know, we've been able to achieve a lot of uh, positive outcomes together uh, as a team. So that's that's good. But but again, you know, because we, we all come from different backgrounds and we didn't, uh, and also, again, you know, they're different ethnic groups and you know different party lines and and things things like that but those are not really uh i i don't see them as barriers i see them as a you know a stepping stone for all of us to really build uh a consensus and you know more deeper level of understanding amongst us and and that's what really binds us all together mm. and, and uh um uh, you know every day it's a it's a lesson learned and, and we try to we try to be better and, and we try to learn from our mistakes. And, uh, you know, NUG has been able to achieve a lot of, a lot of uh, you know, thanks and, and, you know, progress has been achieved, you know, great, uh, you know, much uh, headways. Uh, nonetheless, you know, we st there's still a long way to go, but so far uh, I, I'm really proud of, you know, where, where how far we've come uh, as a, as a, mm. as a you know, resistance government. I think some of uh, its strengths is its diversity and its uh, innovative character in a way mm. of uh, bringing together people who are professional politicians who have been in parliament for many years and others come from civil society or from other organizations. Mm. It's ethnically and quite diverse mm. more than ever before, yes. uh, gender diverse, yep. uh, and you mostly operate uh, in the virtual world. So mm -hmm. it's rare that you meet each other and mm -hmm. uh, that you have in-person meetings, mm -hmm. but somehow you've been able to adapt. And uh, I think, you know, that is that has been quite remarkable mm -hmm. uh, for others, you know, watching this. Now in your particular, you know, profile uh, as international cooperation uh, deputy minister, how would you say has the attitude of the international community changed over the years? And in what way do you in, interact with international organizations and bilateral partners? Right. So <clears throat> I am going to address the first uh, part of your question about, you know, the challenges that come with, you know, working remotely and also mostly in the virtual world. Um, so um, 
because of the technology, you know, we've been able to bridge the gap, the also physical distance between us, and that hasn't stopped really stopped us from you know get uh, working together <clears throat> effectively. Uh, but definitely uh, different time zones and stuff like that that really uh, can sometimes be uh, you know a uh, challenge, right? In terms of uh, you know, let's say you know you know because we don't really have uh, sort of uh, vacation or holiday, and there's not really a uh, sort of you know rigid working hours or anything so we got to be on standby in a sense right uh, and, and uh, it definitely poses some challenges for uh, you know a lot of us really because you know uh, we're spread across the world and um, you know also you know there are you know some people also uh, have their own um, you know you know families to take care of and also living in some of them live in exile, meaning, you know, they, they also face uh, an added layer of, you know, security threat and stuff like that. So amidst and despite all of that, as you know, we've been able to operate efficiently, uh, really thanks to technology uh, and uh, really our, our, you know, our conviction to, 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 to really win this. Uh, in, you know, over the past three years, uh, our, a lot of the international community and, and our counterparts uh, they they have really grown. They have come to see, you know how how this resistance movement is not just about you know uh, the political rivalry uh, between the political elites vis-a-vis uh, -vis, you know the army versus the NLD. It's it has expanded beyond you know that political dichotomy. Now it has more more. It has obviously morphed into this really large scale you know nationwide resistance movement that aspires to change the system, you know, not just, a, you know, a change of regime, but more about the very transformative change. That's why we call it resistance, uh, you know, uh, nationwide. And, and NUG has been at the forefront of, you know, the revolution and people sometimes do not, uh, sometimes, you know, there, there are a lot of folks, uh, some of the folks that I've spoken to, they are, may not be inclined to see it that way, but I think NUG, you know, NUG has been, you know, has done an incredible job at really garnering different, you know, factions of, uh, you know, political life and bringing them together and, and really building this sort of cohesive uh, political force, you know, consolidated a lot of the, you know, uh, you know, uh, both de jour and, uh, and de facto powers uh, and, and really build this uh, as a core power and stand up to the regime. And obviously, you know, none of that would have been made possible without the help and support and, and a lot of, you know, uh, inputs and, you know, help from our ERO partners. Mm. Uh, having said that, you know, uh, our, and also that really in turn, uh, you know, uh, shape and direct a lot of our engagement and the way we engage with our bilateral partners because they really see it, uh, the way they perceive and the way they make assessment of, you know, what, how the resistance movement it's quote unquote uh performing and they would really look to how the military progress you know has been uh look you know uh, has looked like you know in the country and that's the, sort of the barometer of the international community you know they tend to see how things are going in terms of you know how much consensus and political sort of agreement uh that the you know nug and their its allies have been able to build mm. uh, around it and also how much of you know uh, capacity or you know capability to actually govern the sort of the liberated areas mm. so that's the sort of the parameter that they use to assess the effectiveness of uh, the NUG and the resistance movement as a whole mm. so that really it's uh, uh, an, 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 an indicator you know for the international community to, to look at when they uh, engage and when when they try to engage with us mm. or going forward I think it'll be also uh, I think it really is incumbent upon us to to get uh, the work done, and, and that will actually open a lot a lot of doors and a lot of opportunities for the international community to be to be part of and to to come in and be more supportive. Mm. Uh, but then I think it's like my my point really is it, it is our job really to to um, to get this thing going forward, mm -hmm. and and, uh, and I, I think we have what it takes, mm. and we 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 also would like to acknowledge the role of the international community and the sort of, uh, uh, you know, the role that they can play in all of this, and, and we have to 
cooperate and we have to work side by side mm -hmm. and, and I think we can do this uh, together. So am I right if I say that the focus is maybe less on the formal recognition of uh, the international community as the government of Myanmar, only very few mm. international organizations, international idea included, mm. actually recognize the NUG as the government of Myanmar. But that has mostly to do with those organizations' presence inside the country rather than with the performance of the NUG. And the way, if I understand you right, you're now basically focusing more pragmatically on just getting the job done, doing what is possible, both internationally and on the ground in partnership with the EROs and showing to the people that you can deliver. Mm -hmm. uh, I have seen a number of recent surveys uh, which all actually demonstrate that the NUG does, is the institution with the highest level of trust mm -hmm. among the people. Uh, I think a lot of that also comes with expectations mm. that are not always fulfilled uh, but the you know uh, inability of the NUG to mm. actually manage state resources of mm. course limits very much the the range of actions that you can take mm. so we've already spoken a bit about the international outreach uh, now when it comes to the you say governing on the ground mm. how would you describe you know the experiences of you know the the NUG not wanting to be a directly implementing locally governing central government but actually being a, a federal government that that got that sort of steers and coordinates in partnership with others mm. what sort of are, are some of the experiences you've mm. seen from some of the liberated areas where the eros have a long-standing presence sure uh I mean, that's a great question and definitely a hard one to to give answer to uh, you know, we, we experiment and we try to, you know, work things out and, and see, you know, how, how far we can go and also uh, really try to, you know, find uh, middle ground in whatever, uh, in, 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 the, in the way we try to, uh, you know, make this governance a, a system work, right? Mm -hmm. and, and particularly in, in an area where the, uh, you know, ERO uh, have, you know, uh, the longest you know control over for the longest time uh and, and really we got to be very careful about not you know uh really uh we don't want to come across as you know NUG is trying to control everything and, and uh and, and impose you know some of our uh you know policies or so everything that has to be coordinated and, and also we we are tr there needs to be a sort of you know, create a pathway or uh, create a space for both the NUG and uh, the, the emerging local, you know, governance uh, structures to, to, to come together and, uh, and try, to, try to discuss. And I, I think best way to describe this would be a process in which both parties uh, will, you know, try to reach an agreement on, on a lot of the things that matter most to the uh, inhabitants of that that state mm. federal unit uh so it, it's you know it's really it's there's a there there's needs to be a perfect balance right that you need to be able to strike the perfect balance and there's a where do we where do you draw the boundaries right and how how much of a say do you have or how much of a role uh do you do you you know do you want to uh give yourself or also for the other person right uh, so that means a lot of, uh, you know, I think anything before anything else comes the, uh, the mutual trust and, uh, and the, I guess, the sort of common vision, mm. you know, politically and, mm. and the rest of the things I think uh, uh, will, you know, come later. Mm. Uh, so it's, it's the, really what's most important for, for us uh, as we speak right now, it's the, the, the process of coming together and building this uh, understanding and, and being on the same page when it mm. comes to the kind of, you know, federal uh, structure, you know, that we envision for, uh, you know, future Myanmar. Mm. So, yeah, it's it's back and forth. And sometimes, you know, we, we, we learn as we go, mm. uh, so to speak. Uh, but so far, I mean, it's been, you, you know, nothing. If we, if, we, if we can start and work without any reduce level of violence and, and like a semblance of stability 
and, and I think that's when things can actually, you know, work, and people can actually sit on the table, and we can we can actually discuss mm. in a civil manner, and and, uh, and the rest of the things I think we can manage. Mm. So a uh, solution oriented, collaborative pragmatism guided by a common vision exactly. for the future, yes. and uh, that holds strong. Yeah. How would you describe that? sort of big ultimate vision. I mean, we're talking about federal democracy, mm. but when you envisage that, you know, for the, as a young person, mm. member of the young generation, what is the vision for the new Myanmar that you would like to see in 10, 15 years? Mm. In 10, 15, 15 years, uh, Myanmar. If all goes well. If all goes well, it will. Uh, so these, uh, you know, we, we I think per, on a personal level, I think we need to be, uh, bold, and we need to prepare ourselves for a, a, a an entirely different Myanmar. Uh, what I meant by that is, you know, uh, the conventional wisdom, or uh, you know, at least you know that's that's how we, that's what we're told. You know, when as, as you know when we were, you know, kids in school, it's Myanmar has always been this perfect, and 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 this strong union. You know, made up of. Uh, seven states and seven divisions and uh, that's and we have to come to terms with the fact that we have now entered a, uh, a new paradigm where everything is possible and, and what we're trying to do is uh, not chaotic uh, first of all so I don't want to give a, give the impression to the entire community uh, uh, mostly that we're not we're not like wayward clouds or anything we have a vision and we have a roadmap and we have this uh federal democracy charter uh, which is a blueprint for uh, uh the federal units and the nug and and different uh you know allies to 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 really it is it's a you know it's a uh it's a moral compass right and also it, it really it's uh it, it outlines it, it you know outlines a lot of uh detail process you know to 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 for us to follow through and that really you know gives us a good idea about you know the kind of future we want for ourselves mm -hmm. and so going back to the new paradigm so i'm confident in our ability to to build a better myanmar where there's greater um justice social justice and you know a uh, more equitable society uh based on you know mutual respect and you know um uh, this this love for democracy and freedom and, and everyone will be treated equally uh etc so that's the kind mm. of future that i want for my country and we're working towards that what would you say are the key asks from the international community what the NUJ has been trying to reach out a lot. Your ministers, co-ministers, you yourself are traveling a lot, reaching out, telling the story, mm -hmm. making the case. What concretely do you think international organizations or bilateral governments could do more to help bring about that vision that you just outlined? Well, that's, that's, that's a perfect, uh, perfectly valid question, right? And uh, a lot of the times, uh, um, you know, there's no one, uh, one size, you know, fits all, you know, sort of answer or solution to, to, this is sort of an enigma for most of the, for a lot of the folks, right? And a lot of international communities and partners that we work with, because, you know, if the answer was uh, quite obvious, then everybody would have, you know, got the right ideas and like, they would all be sort of contributing to that uh, way of working. But things are not as straightforward or, you know, sometimes, uh, but obviously, you know, maybe not all so obvious, but there are, there are things that we would like our international partners, you know, bilateral, multilateral, uh, to, to be, to pay, you know, attention to is that, you know, they got to also see the, re see the, our struggle for democracy as a resistance and revolution. And, and that really, because at the core of it, it's the notion that, you know, military has to leave, has to go. And we are not going to entertain any idea uh, that the military will still be counted as this uh, credible partner or part of the equation to solving this 
decade long decades long problem mm -hmm. you know that has been you know, ramp, you know uh really you know disruptive to to our country's development and, mm -hmm. and progress so military has to go so that has to be uh you know come before anything else so i think that that notion will guide in everything that they do because as long as they're not if they cannot divorce from the idea that the military has to leave then then you know to some extent you know what they do will be dictated by uh sort of uh you know the that's the really you know goes to goes to show that why a lot of the organizations choose to uh, have some level of communications with Nipiro and knowingly or unknowingly, you know, uh, conferring legitimacy to the junta, which we don't want. So that they, they have to be willing and bold enough to to really rethink and recalibrate uh, the modality of uh, uh, the modus operandi uh, of these organizations and these entities. And they have to go all in. Uh, obviously, mm. that, uh, I'm speaking on, you know, mm. For the resistance and i'm part of the nug so i i, I would <laughs> strongly encourage and urge our international partners to go all in and be supportive of all the initiatives and any initiatives that that really strengthen and you know uplift the communities that are you know most affected by this conflict uh whether that be in terms of you know humanitarian support or whether that be technical support to the emerging local governance structure and also to the nug we we, we are you know we, we are overseeing a lot of the uh, programs and, uh, you know, uh, projects uh, which are meant to help with, with exactly that mm. uh, to, to, to have us, you know, thriving sort of environment and, and, and sort of, you know, viable conditions where, you know, bottom up uh, federalism can come about and NUG will then uh, try to be the least centralized, the least unitary uh, federal government. Uh, that Myanmar will have, mm. Myanmar will ever see, mm. and, and we're really experimenting with this never seen before, uh, you know, phenomenon in Myanmar, where you know, in Southeast Asia, you see there is a mix of, you know, so there's uh, constitutional republics, there are monarchs, there are, you know, different sorts of, uh, you know, uh, systems. Mm. But Myanmar will be the first country that the world will see that revolution will actually result in uh, a success for democracy. Uh, and that extends beyond the borders of Myanmar, mm. and that's something we can all be proud of. Mm. And that they have a, they they will have a, and they will be also proud of the fact that they have played a mm. major role in, in in helping us achieve our dreams. Now, some of the neighboring countries, especially and the regional mm. ASEAN partners, are perhaps a bit skeptical about that prospect of uh, democracy unleashed. Uh, what what have been some of your experiences of interacting with counterparts in the region. Mm. Uh, you have talked a lot with European, mm. North American, Australian counterparts, but in the region there is probably a lot more skepticism about the, mm. the prospect of revolution. Mm. Now, can you give some example of a conversation that comes to mind or, or some experience where that you found particularly, you know, mm. in, insightful in terms of, you know, showing the difficulty of getting the Asian neighbors sure. on board. Sure. Yeah. Uh, again, uh, another, uh, you know, segue and that will, you know, at least give a glimpse into what the thinking of uh, a lot of our, you know, important and powerful neighbors, you know, when it comes to uh, how they want to deal with the, you know, the conflict in Myanmar. Because it's really there's a you know a spillover effect, especially Thailand, right? Because we share such a long border and also you know history, shared history between these two countries, and also India, very powerful countries. But a lot of they you know a lot of the things that they do and the thinking in New Delhi is really uh, the parameter. It's really set by the think uh, a lot of influential policymakers that that give advice to Modi uh, administration. But mostly really through the lens of how they can sort of contain or at least uh, counteract the China effect. So it's been, from, my, from our perspective, it's, it's been largely unfair because this is really 
not just about the rivalry between India and China, but this is about a people's struggle. We want our aspirations for greater freedom, our aspirations to get rid of dictatorship once and for all, uh, mm. and, and, and our desire to see prosperity and uh, equality and, and, uh, and for all people, including the most persecuted you know, ethnic minorities like the Rohingya, the Kachins, the, the Karenis, the Christians, the, the LGBTs, etc. So we're talking about an absolute, uh, a, a complete departure from, from how Burma was. Mm. And that may have become sort of an uncomfortable uh, reality that most of our neighboring states, it's, it's something that is absolutely uh, extraordinary. Like too, 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 uh, too big of a hassle, so to speak, for yeah. a lot of these. But it may, of course, elements. appeal more to young people in deeper in society who are exactly. not part of po of government and politics in the neighboring countries. And so, right. the the Myanmar Democratic Revolution might actually have an appeal. And I know yes. some countries uh, are following very closely right. from that perspective that mm -hmm. it. It is a transformation. It is yes. uh, much deeper than just a, si a system change. Yes. And in that sense, it might also hold some promise for the for, for sure. the wider region. For sure. I would like to ask you one last question, sort of a bit more on a personal level. Mm. As a young person from Myanmar, you've you had an international uh, education. You, uh, you have spent years abroad. You have a, a, an open worldview. You were one of the beneficiaries of the opening period of the, the 10 years of reforms. Yeah. Uh, you chose to join this interim administration. You could also have done many other things. I would like to uh, ask you what would be your advice or appeal to young people of your generation? How should they look at this struggle, at mm. this uh, interim institutions? Mm. There is sometimes a lot of criticism, you know, people don't really buy into the rhetoric of federal democracy. They may be a bit blasé about them, democracy as a whole, about parties. They might be more interested in pursuing a business career or something mm. like that. So especially people like you with an international education, what would be your sort of uh, uh, pitch to them on why they should support, why they should give the benefit of the doubt to the NUG and its allies and to this democratic revolution? And what could they do to contribute uh, more themselves? Yes, uh, that's, that's, that's a great question. Uh, mm -hmm. Well, to be honest, I, I, I don't think I will ever, you know, be able to come up with the most sort of perfect and the most convincing answer to that. But it, I am speaking from the bottom of my heart, the bottom of my heart, and, and I really hope this will resonate with a lot of the younger folks, uh, the younger millennials, Gen Z, uh, that they can sort of see my point where, where I'm coming from. So really, you cannot separate politics from, especially, you know, in, in the case of Myanmar, it's politics. And really, when it comes down to it, it's, uh, it, 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 it's really, um, you know, at the forefront of our socioeconomic lives. So without the stability of a functioning operational government and without democracy, really, you can't do anything else. So you've, you've, you've seen, you, you also said it, Marcus, really, you know, you nailed it. Like I, I was one of the, you know, beneficiaries of, of the, uh, the opening years, you know, uh, the, during the, ref, you know, refor reformative years, uh, you know, partly by the, uh, the latter part of the Thing Seng administration and the NLD administration, and and, and you, you, we we saw the potential uh, that the country the, uh, country held, and a lot of the people benefited from that opening, uh, and a lot of the opportunities came to Myanmar, and a lot of young people were able to study, you know, uh, study abroad on lo lots of different scholarship programs, and they chose to come back and contribute to that, the process of opening even more. And uh, with a hope to bring bring in more aid and bring in more intellect and bring in more uh, support to 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 this country that really needed help, uh, uh, and but you know, May Online you know turned everything upside down, and we we don't have to go into you know details. There. But my message to the uh, young younger folks is that if you don't play 
your part. And everybody else is thinking that way. And, and that's really, it's a, what do you call? It's a vicious cycle, right? And, and we, 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 we need to do our part. And you got to understand that you cannot be successful on your own in the kind of environment such as the, uh, the one we have in Myanmar, because unless we have a functioning democracy and a civilian, you know, uh, unless we're able to restore civilian control and absolutely without the military going back to his barrack, I don't think uh, other any other aspects of our lives will come to, uh, will, will, I don't think we will be able to achieve our full potentials. Mm. So this is the time, now is the time, and if not now, when, right? So I, I think it's really a great reminder to any of us really to, to be doing anything or everything we can, wherever you may be. And uh, so why, if, if, we, if we were to give benefit of the doubt to, uh, to the lot of the actors you know, that are involved in, in the resistance movement, uh, the NUG has the most potential and the most credibility uh, because of the you know the results and outcomes we've been in, able to deliver and uh, w what we've been able to achieve together so uh, I think that's that's should be you know quite obvious uh, for you to to realize that now is the time and you we, we all have to do our part and you know because uh, if we the, the sort of the uh, collective force you know and, and sort of the collective uh, strength that we can bring to this uh, revolution it, 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 it transcends everything else mm. and, and this this will in turn uh, be a formidable force that the junta cannot mess with mm. and, and they, they've seen it and this this force has manifested in a lot of different ways mm. and and, and uh, in, you know a lot of PDFs and and also you know the more you know technology savvy you know folks uh, are at the forefront of a lot of our, you know, innovations, you know, w w when it comes to drones or, mm. you know, um, stuff like that. Mm. So this message should, should be, you know, a resounding or uh, uh, invitation to, to uh, I think, greater uh, the rest of the population, of, especially, you know, the younger demographics to, mm. to be more involved and to be, to be more confident in their ability that they can each play their own role. Mm. They have a role to play. So if uh, so, the NUG is ready for and open for receiving more assistance, more collaboration in various forms. If somebody sees this, they would be interested. They say, "I would like to do my part." Can they get in touch with you and say, "You know, can we discuss how I could contribute?" Absolutely. Yeah. So we will try yes. to organize the, the the communication channel for yes. that. Yeah. David, thank you very much for this conversation yes. and uh, good luck and. Uh, Congratulations for the work uh, and let's hope that the goals that you have set yourself uh, are within reach and will be achieved soon and uh, that the international community can really roll up its sleeves and uh, assist fully in the reconstruction and in the rehabilitation of your country. And we hope that we will all be able to go back there soon and uh, get the work done. And uh, I hope to see you playing a, a a role in one way or another in this. Thank you very much. Thank you, Marcus. Thank you for watching. Uh, we will post some links uh, uh, under this video and uh, we will get back to you soon. Thank you.